Barclay from ABC Radio National. Thanks for coming along this Saturday evening to uh, this session of the Ideas Festival, which is sponsored by Health Workforce Australia. What comes after global warming? It's not a question asked very often, preoccupied as we are with carbon emissions, their contribution to the warming of the planet, what should be done about it, and uh, what will happen if we don't. And the long view of climate change is generally regarded as the end of the 21st century, but tonight's speaker, Kurt Steger, really takes the long view. I think it's fair to say not many of us spend our time wondering about the cooling of the planet, the next ice age, if it can be prevented, what the world will look like during the next ice age and life on it in a hundred thousand years time. Kurt Steger is an ecologist, a paleoclimatologist and science writer. This is his latest book. It's called Deep Future, the next 100,000 years of life on Earth. Um, and he writes of global warming followed sharply by global cooling, climate whiplash. It's called, I commend the book to you. I've just started reading it, it's fascinating. Who knows, maybe you can get it from the State Library Bookstore. Worth trying to find anyway. Uh, if you think that there's plenty to worry about with the warming of the planet, I can assure you that is small beer compared to the next ice age. At the end of Kurt's presentation, um, we'll have time for some questions. I look forward to them. Don't be shy. Uh, we'll have about 15 minutes or so for questions. I'll just leave Kurt up on the stage. You can put your hand up or you know, grab his attention and fire away your comments and thoughts. For now, though, please welcome Kurt Stager. much for coming out on a Saturday night when you could be at the ball or the music and uh, I'll try to make this as interesting as, as possible. Um, you don't often hear about climate change in the future over such large time scales um, and I'd like to introduce you to some aspects of climate change that you don't normally hear about in the media. Um, I'll reassure you from the outset of what the talk is not about. Um, I, I suspect some of you may have come here thinking that uh, this would be kind of the same old uh, cultural divide, political arguments about whether global warming is real or uh, if humans are causing it and things like that. Um, it's not about that. Um, just out of curiosity though, I, I like doing a little survey if you don't mind of the people that I'm talking to, just to see who's in the room. Um, if, if you wouldn't mind putting up your hand if you believe that global warming is real and mostly due to humans. Okay. Uh, how many of you would disagree how many of you would rather not say public? <laughs> yeah, it's interesting. Uh, I'm not going to go there, but I will will tell you that uh, while that kind of argument is going on, um, the climate science community has basically taken it um, as fact and has moved on from that. And what I'll introduce you to tonight is the kinds of things people are working on now, and sort of the cutting edge of climate change in, in modern circles. My background is as a climate historian, and I study natural climate changes and cycles, and things like that. So what I'll be doing is introducing you to the, the latest views of where the global warming thing will be leading us, um, also looking to the past for lessons to say what that might actually look like. Um, so I'd, I'd first like to tell you about a term here that's entered the scientific lexicon now, um, sort of demonstrating the certainty we have of the human impacts on the planet. And if you make this list of not just the climate effects and the greenhouse gases building up, but the extinction of species, the invasive species, the way we're altering landscapes and making chemical signals around the world that are being now laid down in sediment layers for future geologists to dig up, um, a lot of scientists have decided, well, um, when we talk about the history of the Earth, we basically have this large span of time and we've broken it up into blocks of time that we call epochs. And we characterize them based on what species may have been around or what climatic in, uh, changes may have happened. Um, so you'll have things like the Eocene epoch and the Pliocene epoch and the Holocene epoch based on those kinds of things. And uh, people have gotten together and said, well, by any of those definitions, um, these are large enough changes of a geological scale to merit being called its own new epoch. 
And so using the terminology of that, kind of in the um, tradition of talking about the age of dinosaurs, the age of mammals, um, we're now talking about the age of humans, where we're so numerous, our technology is so powerful, and we're so interconnected now that we've become a geologic force of nature. And so there's a technical term now, maybe some of you started to hear this, even if you're not in the scientific circles, we're calling this the Anthropocene epoch right now, or Anthropocene. It basically translates to the age of humans. That's Gene Stormer, an ecologist, who first came up with the term. Um, so I'm going to be focusing mostly on the, the last feature here, but it's just one of many features that tell us that we are in a brand new chapter of Earth's history in which humans are dominating the changes that are going on and are making a record in uh, geologic history. Um, another term I should point out very quickly too, um, because I'm going to be talking about climate changes over thousands of years, you could legitimately ask, how can you even consider talking about a prediction of climate that far in advance if you can't even predict the weather next week? And uh, I want to make sure that the terms are clear here. I'm actually not talking about weather that far in the future because you're right, you can't uh, that far in advance. Climate is a different thing. It's a broad brush average over large areas and long time periods, whereas weather is a here and now phenomenon that's a lot more random. So it's, it's kind of like looking at this picture of the road here, where the long upward journey to the top of the ridge there is the climate trend of going up. But you'll have ups and downs along the way, and that's weather. So uh, what I'll be talking about tonight is uh, climate change over long time periods, and uh, actually, oddly enough, if you talk of large enough scales like this, of the whole planet, and large blocks of time, it's actually easier to predict, in a broad brush uh, sense, what's coming down the pike, instead of trying to nail down specifics of exactly what happens where. Um, so hopefully I'll be able to convince you of that. Um, the other thing that I'll be trying to do is uh, introduce you to larger time scales than we normally think about. So as I said, I'm a, I'm a climate historian. I'm used to talking about millions of years or thousands of years. And um, I'm realizing, of course, that that's not the time scale that most of us live our lives on. Uh, you know, for most folks, you know, the end of the work day is forever. Or a student, you know, the end of the class. You know. um, when we've heard people talking about not only modern climate change, but where it will lead us if we don't do anything or you know, whatever, um, usually the predictions go into the future and uh, consider a long-term view of the future to be 100 years. And they'll say, if, if, if we don't do this or if we do that, within 100 years, by 2100 AD, we'll have these conditions and here's what the computer models tell us. Um, what I'd like to do is uh, move on from that and ask what to someone like me seems like an obvious question. Uh, a hundred years doesn't seem like a long time for a climate historian. And the first thing I, I would want to ask is, well, why are we stopping at 2100 AD? As if it's just the edge of the horizon beyond which there's nothing to imagine. Uh, what's over that ridge of 2100 AD? It's like, almost like uh, the, in the old days when we had maps of the world, they'd say, don't sail your ship out to that horizon because there'll be dragons out there or you'll fall off the edge of the earth. Uh, I'd like to take you over that edge of the earth into the future and uh, hopefully convince you that what we can see there um, actually has some merit to it and some weight to it. So basically the way um, this handful of scientists around the world is getting at this is asking a pretty basic question, which may not have occurred to a lot of folks until now. Um, they're basically asking where does the carbon dioxide, the heat trap and gas, where does it go? once it leaves our tailpipes and our smokestacks. And uh, now, of course, it doesn't just go out into space, right up, you know, infinitely up or anything like that. It's held by gravity close to the Earth. So it doesn't go very far when it blows downwind from where we are. It just goes to another part of the world. Um, so that's the fundamental question that we can now build the picture of the future around. And as it turns out, um, the geochemists that study this say that most of the carbon dioxide that we emit is going to eventually end up dissolving in the oceans just by down through the surface. We 
because gases in the atmosphere do that naturally. It's how oxygen gets in the water for fish to breathe. Carbon dioxide goes in there. So that's the ultimate destination. But if you add up how much seawater there is in the world and how carbon dioxide gets into it, what we find out is the oceans will absorb most of it, but they can't take all of it. There's between a quarter and a fifth of it that the oceans will not be able to take, and that fraction will be left stranded in the air for a very long time. Eventually, it will be absorbed, and there will be a recovery. It'll be done by some of these reactions, and we won't get into great detail, but the basic story is um, up in that upper panel up there. It's just that the carbon dioxide dissolves in rain. It makes a weak acid. It's called carbonic acid, so it's in solution. It hits limestone or granite or rocks and soils, has a chemical reaction with them, and ends up crumbling the rock a bit. And all that stuff gets into groundwater and streams. So the carbon atoms that were floating in the air are now in the water. They flow downhill, and they end up in the ocean too. Well, the, the, when that happens, that form of the carbon acts kind of like an antacid pill for the great banquet on carbon dioxide that the ocean has been going through. And the ocean can now absorb even more CO2 from the air the more of that uh, mineral stuff goes in. So um, eventually, it does end up in the ocean, but it may have to go through this second step of reacting with the rocks and the soils. And as you'll see up here, um, it's a very long, slow process to remove this stuff from the air. So assuming that we aren't going to you know, do some high-tech, costly way of pulling carbon dioxide out of the air artificially, we're probably going to leave it to the oceans and the rocks. If we do, it doesn't take just decades, it doesn't take just centuries like we had been thinking before. When you go through the bookkeeping of this, we find it takes thousands of years for this recovery. So basically, the, the gist of it then is the changes we're setting in motion now are of immense duration, not just in you know, intense severity, but they're going to last a really, really long time. That's pretty shocking. Now, this uh, term climate whiplash is something I just came up with. And I basically come up, came up with the idea after reading some of these nerdy scientific papers with their graphs and such talking about this. And, uh, it really kind of made common sense what they were saying, first of all, about where the stuff goes. But then they, they had another point. They said, uh, basically, what goes up must come down. At some point, um, we're going to stop emitting so much carbon dioxide, either soon, because we switch to non-carbon fuels quickly in the next few decades, or some later time. And in the most extreme case, it's because we just go on as usual until we burn it all up, and then we're forced to switch. So at some point, we're going to not emit so much. Um, so let me just sort of point to this graph right here. Here's the time, there's the present day, and there's the future. There are no numbers on it or anything. But this arrow is showing that uh, what we're on now is where the arrow is going up, and that's our carbon dioxide emissions are going up. Well, at some point, they're going to level off. For those reasons I was telling you, we're either going to switch or we're going to run out and have to switch. So it, it's going to reach a peak and then drop back down again at some point. Well, as our emission rate peaks and starts to drop off, so will the amount that's in the air. It's not going to go up forever. There's not an endless supply of carbon to do this with. There's going to be a point that's going to follow. So this next bump goes like that. And because the carbon dioxide traps heat, the temperatures are going to do the same thing, too. There has to be some point where we've got as hot as it's going to get, and then it's going to flip into a recovery mode like that, which actually, although the temperature is higher than it is now, will be recovering and dropping again closer to normal, so it would actually be uh, cooling from that higher temperature right there. And so when I, when I talk about the whiplash thing, it's that all the adaptive strategies that we and other species have been having to get used to this or to deal with this warming that we're so focused on right now, when that peak comes and flips into the recovery mode, then all of those adaptive strategies will be obsolete and they're going to have to deal with the opposite kinds of change, which if you think about it, can be just as stressful. It's the, the climate
climatic change or the environmental changes themselves that put stress on people and cultures and ecosystems. So there's a lot more to the global warming story than the global warming. There's this very interesting turnaround time where you get the change in the CO2 followed by a peak in temperature. And then what I have here in the last part is even as the temperature peaks and starts to come down, it's still hotter than it is now. So the ice sheets are still melting and the ocean is still rising. So we'll have this odd thing in the whiplash time when you'll have temperatures falling, but the sea level's still going up. So that finally comes into the line too. So to me, it was like, wow, oh, it's, we've been talking about this global warming thing. And it's just like talking about the first page in a book that's really long. And we've only spoken about the introductory part, not realizing that we're setting a lot more things in motion than just the warming. There's this whiplash phase that's going to be very interesting. And then the recovery phase is also potentially stressful, too. So this will be the last graph I'll show you. This is what one of the things that made me want to write the book. There are several dozen peer-reviewed papers now out in the literature that have been coming out in the last five years or so. And they all basically uh, show pretty much the same thing. So I've compiled all their stuff into one graph. Um, that alone should be of interest, because these laboratories that do this work are scattered around the whole planet, and in a sense, they're competitors with each other. So if there was a flaw in the thinking or the modeling in any one of these models, the others would be sure to point it out and disagree with it and try to replace it. But they're all very consistent. So uh, let me show you this. This is, uh, as I said, what really got my attention, especially as a climate historian, because of the time scales involved and the drama of the changes. So what we have here is time going this way. Here's the present day, and there's 10,000 years in the future, 20, 30, 40, all the way out to 100,000 years. So right away, this gets my attention. This is the time scale that ice ages happen on, not just something that we're doing, but this is just shocking that uh, our legacy can last that long. Um, now what I've got here is the amount of heat trapping carbon dioxide in the air. And this is actually two graphs in one. So what I've done was map out what the computer models are saying about two possible paths we could take into the future. One is if we switch quickly away from the fossil fuels to the alternatives, which even if you don't believe this climatic story, we have lots of good reasons for doing it, for energy security and economic reasons and things like that too. Anyway, um, if we switch quickly in the next few decades, then the carbon dioxide story will follow this dotted line. So this is the amount of CO2 in the air. And the star is about where we are now. It's just below 400 parts per million, which is very much the air in the room here. It's about that much. If we go down the moderate path, then our emissions will peak relatively soon. And we can expect probably to have between 550 and 600 parts per million in CO2 at the maximum. Then, as you may be able to see here, this dotted line drops pretty quickly. That's from the ocean soaking that stuff up. And it'll take, actually, a couple of thousand years to do that. But the other thing to notice is, notice uh, here it's very steep. And then it doesn't come all the way back down to today. It actually levels off. Um, and this is actually before the Industrial Revolution. Anyhow, look at this. It just keeps going and going very, very slowly, getting rid of the last dregs of that stuff. In our best case scenario, it's probably going to take about 100,000 years to recover in the best case scenario from what we're doing now. So let me just say at the outset, um, don't let that paralyze you with despair and make you jump off a bridge. It's too late to do anything because we have a choice to make. Yes, this, these are huge changes that we're setting in motion. We're locked into this already, but notice it's not that severe. And the alternative, if we don't do something and switch as quickly as possible, if we burn all of the coal, oil, and gas we've got in the next few centuries, then that solid line is what we head for. And it can get as high as maybe almost 2,000 parts per million Air. The more stuff, of course, the warmer it would get. The other thing to notice is, look at that. It's like a sharp spike and how dramatic that warming is that will follow that. And then a rapid turnaround and then a rapid cooling 
for probably 5,000 years of dramatic change, including the whiplash. And then the ocean has taken up as much as it can. This is the rocks and soils trying to clean up the last dregs of it. And notice this, it goes right off the scale. It doesn't even come back down to normal in 100,000 years. This doesn't come down all the way until about half a million years. So that's the choice. And the most amazing thing, I think, for me is not only just the scientific interest of having that far future to deal with, but that this is the critical time where the decision's going to be made. It's in basically our lifetime, the next several decades, or basically this century, the decision will be made whether the climate disruptions last 100,000 years or half a million years, and how intense they're going to be. So what I'd like to do next um, is uh, try to give you a sense of what this might involve. And this is where my specialty will start coming in, is uh, using lessons from the past to sort of fill in the gaps on that story. Then. What would it be like if we do the moderate case or if we do the extreme case? Um, and maybe surprisingly, we actually have natural examples from the geologic past of each of those kinds of things happening even without so uh, here's the first, this is the first one, the moderate case. If we switch quickly away from the fossil fuels, we can maybe hope to get to 550, 600 parts per million CO2, probably end up with two or three degrees centigrade global warming from that eventually. Um, looking back to history, um, we've had that happen many times in the past. Um, what I have here is a picture from that movie called Ice Age showing the, the stuff melting away in between. And the, the point there is every time you have an ice age, it eventually comes to an end, and there's a natural global warming that follows that for thousands of years. And then another ice age comes, and they've been doing this for the last two to three million years just in natural cycles. Well, those natural warm times between the ice ages we call interglacials. And uh, they're very similar to what we would look for if we do the moderate case. And we've actually got very good um, historical records from rocks and fossils and, and soils to show us what that would be like. So for example, if we go back in time before the last ice age, about 130,000 years ago, you could have gone to Northern Europe. If you went up to England, let's say, there's, there, those are the white cliffs of Dover, 130,000 years. Uh, you would have encountered elephants, hippos, water buffalo, a lot of the animals you normally would associate with Africa, tromping around and bothering people probably in England and uh, Germany. They were you know, water buffalo drinking from the Rhine River. And it's because it was warm enough up there that tropical type animals moved north into those habitats. When you warm the planet like that, more water evaporates into the air from the oceans, and also the circulation of the atmosphere gets more intense. You get more stronger, you get stronger monsoons, and basically more rainfall, especially in the tropics. So at, at that time, the Sahara Desert was basically green, and there were gigantic lakes and rivers out there that you now see the remains of um, out there in the desert. So it was wetter and greener in a lot of the tropics. Um, where uh, Carrie and I live in a northern state of New York, up near the Canadian border in the States, um, our forests were quite different. They were actually like forests from the deep south down in Georgia and the Carolinas. Uh, and we know that from the pollen of the vegetation that has fallen into the lake settings that you can dig up and examine under a microscope. So basically the story then is you make the tropics warmer and greener, and uh, animals and plants basically move closer to the poles because it's warmer up there and they're uncomfortable there. It was warmer than now by a couple of degrees, maybe even three degrees centigrade, for about 13,000 years in that last interglacial. That's a long time. Um, and during that warmer time, there was a lot of melting up in the Arctic. As you might expect, just as there is around Greenland now, but what you may not have heard as we had talked about the dramatic melting that we're measuring and how fast it's going in Greenland, especially around the edges, we often don't put that in the context of how big the Greenland ice sheet is, or these other big ice sheets, they're enormous. 
components. So even though large amounts of melt is happening, it takes thousands of years for those things to melt away. So the last interglacials did not destroy Greenland. It was uh, no more than a third to a half of it melted during the last interglacial. So we could maybe expect something like that also to happen if we get the moderate case. And of course, if you do melt, you know, on half of Greenland and a lot of West Antarctica, sea level does come up and you also warm the ocean. And we've got very good evidence that that happens too. In fact, uh, Western Australia is one of the classic sites for this. If you go around Perth and Rottnest Island, you can see old coral reefs that were growing in position and almost uh, 10 meters above sea level now where the ocean was during that warmer time. Now the sea level has dropped and exposed them and they're just fossilized. Uh, also South Africa where I've done most of, a lot of my work, um, up near Durban, you're on the beach there, there's some big boulders and way up on top of fossilized oysters that used to be underwater from that time too. So, um, and by the way, Emian is the name, the geologic name of that warm time. So um, for folks that may think the possibility of sea level rise, of glacial melting, of global warming happening at all, if uh, people are doubting that um, and thinking that maybe our predictions are not founded in good science, this should very well illustrate that this absolutely can happen because it's happened naturally even without us helping. So all of these are very realistic. Um, and perhaps surprisingly, even the extreme situation has happened before. And we can see what that would be like. Again, this is, this is way before there were people. There were humans in those interglacials, the last interglacial. This is 55 million years ago, um, sh relatively shortly after the demise of the dinosaurs. There was a, a somewhat unexplained, massive, natural global warming that was actually a super greenhouse that warmed about as quickly as what we could do. It lasted thousands of years, about the time scale of what we would do. Um, one idea for what caused it was um, these methane ices you may have heard about in permafrost and the deep sea. Um, something made those come out, probably maybe eruptions in the Atlantic and also burning the organic mud at the bottom of the sea. We're not sure. But a, a large amount went into the air, and then it sort of started these feedbacks where the warming caused increased decay and other processes to add on to make it a super greenhouse, which is kind of what we would be afraid we would set in motion in a similar manner. When that happened, we have geologic evidence of what the world was like. Um, here's now notice the continents were in slightly different positions back then, but um, there was no ice at the poles. The Arctic Ocean was completely ice-free, just like we say we may be doing soon. Uh, it was warm enough you could have gone swimming there in the summer and barely shivered. Um, basically, anything that required a cold weather habitat would have been wiped out. Um, polar bears and all actually made it through the interglacial, but they wouldn't have made it through this. Um, we don't know exactly what animals and plants would enjoy this kind of a situation because it's so far back in time. But we do know vegetation was found cold to cold. And we also know mammals in general, although they were early mammals, like back then whales had legs and were walking around on land. You know, none of our modern species were around then, but the mammals that were there seemed to do fine and they lived pretty much anywhere. So um, they actually liked it, I guess. Um, as I said, there was vegetation from pole to pole. If you went down to Antarctica, it would have looked like that, and it was covered with beech tree forest. If you went up to the Arctic, you can still find the trunks, not just fossilized, but actually mummified, actual tree trunks of redwood forests that lived up right up to the edge of the Arctic Ocean, all the way around uh, the polar regions. So it was a, a very lush habitat for things that like warm, lush habitats, and of course it would have been terrible for anything that liked cold. Uh, when you lose all of the polar ice, of course, that goes in the ocean and sea level came up for about uh, 230 feet or 70 meters, basically. Um, if that happened today over thousands of years with the way the continents are today, this is what the world would look like. Um, sorry I don't have Australia on there, but I do have a semi-flooded Australia for you later if you want to see what that would look like. But if you know your uh, United States geography, there's a state of Florida that's normally in that corner and it's gone if you race sea level. So to sum that up then, um, the global warming that we hear about now is absolutely realistic. It's happened without humans before.
before in the past. Um, but it's interesting that this is just the first stage of the whole process. And now we talk about the warming, making glaciers melt and retreat and things like this. And isn't that shocking that that could happen? But remember, uh, the next chapter of the story will be much longer. And that's when uh, the, what then will seem normal to have uh, such a warm climate. When that starts to recover, that will be experienced as a cooling down to what we think of as normal, but not what people in the future will think of as normal. And so ice sheets and glaciers will start growing again. And maybe, maybe if people have built their towns near those, they'll be afraid of these things coming down and crushing them. So my point is, it's most likely it's the change itself that, uh, that's really the stress, not necessarily warming itself. But, and this should hopefully show that a rapid changes or cooling can be just as uh, difficult to deal with as well. So um, now taking these lessons from history, the things that got through these natural changes in the past pretty much did so by adapting, keeping up with the changes, and also by moving to their preferred habitat spaces. So like your coral reefs, sea levels coming up as it's warming, you know, your strategy is that you know, you're growing as quick as you can to keep up with the shallows. And then of course in the recovery time uh, when a sea level is falling too, which it also does naturally, uh, then you've got to deal with maybe growing at greater depths or out to the sides. The, but uh, adapting to these things and moving around is what enabled a lot of species to deal with these changes in the past. The difference now, um, which I argue does not allow us to say, yes, these have all happened in the past, everything was fine in the past, so why do we care? Um, it's different now, because this is a world with humans all over it. This is the Anthropocene epoch. So species that need, needed to migrate in the past had nothing in their way to block that migration. Now, our cities, roads, farms, settlements are in the way, and things are trapped. It would be a lot more difficult for that migration strategy to work. I'm actually more concerned about other species than I am about humans in terms of extinction because of this, from these changes. I should also add, there's more to global warming than what we've been talking about, not just the whiplash, not just the cooling that follows and the large time scales. There's a whole other aspect that I'll just mention briefly here. I'm not sure how many of you have heard about this. Um, it's basically what happens to the oceans. It's a chemical change that happens that's separate from the climate issue altogether. The climate will eventually recover, but uh, the problem is as the oceans soak up the carbon dioxide from the air, the carbon dioxide dissolves in the water, makes carbonic acid like it does in rain, and that upsets the chemical balance of the oceans. Such that any animal that has a hard part that can dissolve. So the shell of a snail, or a sea urchin, or a crab, or a prawn, or the hard parts of corals can dissolve when the acidity increases. Um, and this problem of ocean acidification is considered easily as important as the climatic effects. Um, and it's already being observed. It's happening observably in the poles. We can see the corrosion of the shells of some of the plankton species already around the polar regions. The next target, if we keep increasing the amount of CO2, the acidity will spread to the bottom of the sea where it's very cold, the polar water will go down there. The uh, productive fisheries in the upwelling zones will go next. And if we go down the extreme path, it will begin to affect the tropical regions, which will be the last ones affected. Um, and so the Great Barrier Reef and places like that will be also involved. So you should be aware of this, and uh, as, as you'll see in a minute, I'll show some examples of where uh, some of these climatic changes, you could argue, could actually be locally beneficial to some individuals at certain times. I don't see a bright side anywhere to ocean acidification. This is the second topic that made me want to write the book, just to self-educate and learn about this. So I urge you to, to learn as much about this as you can as well. So um, as I said, I hope you don't go depressed from here. That's about the low point of the talk, I should let you know. Um, and by now, um, some of you may be wondering, like, uh, you know, why do I need to worry about this? Or why should I even care about this? People aren't going to be around in 100,000 years. So who cares if our thing is going to last that long? Um, actually, if you don't mind, I'd like to do that survey, too. And I predict maybe we'll get slightly different results. 
How many of you in the room believe that humans are going to be around in 100,000 years? Maybe even 1,000 years. Or 2012, even. You know, we're supposed to go extinct in 2012. Okay, now how many of you do not think people will be around in 100,000 years? Yeah, it's usually about 50 50. So it's interesting. Um, I'd be happy to talk to you about it. Obviously, nobody really knows. I make a case that I think we will be. And I think that's an important question to ask because, as I said, if we're not going to be around, then who cares about this at all? Um, I think we're going to be around, or our descendants will be around, and that's one of the reasons why this is important to consider what we want to do. Let me, let me give you the case really quickly. I just figured, all right, well, um, what could really wipe everybody out? Okay, now, and I'm not, remember here, I'm not belittling the suffering that could come with these changes. I'm not talking about population declines or local extinctions of people. I'm talking about total global extinction of homo sapiens. What could make that happen so that there would not be people here in 100,000 years? So I just came up with my own list of, if you disagree with it, that'd be great. Fill me in after the talk, that'd be nice. But I figure those are the big three that could do us in. Uh, okay, disease. Like, you take the worst plagues in history that we know about, like bubonic plague that killed half of Europe and things like that. And of course, when we talk about the magnitude of such a disaster that kills half of Europe, we forget that that also means half of Europe survived this centuries ago without modern medicine. Um, it's difficult to kill out an entire species with a disease when they're numerous partly because some individuals always have a natural, just by chance, a natural resistance. I doubt disease could really kill all of us. We may have some big problems with it, but I don't think that's gonna absolve us from having to experience these changes. Nuclear war, um, with fingers crossed, I, I hopefully think we won't do it. I, I, I think for it to really kill everybody, including you Australians down here in the Southern Hemisphere, um, Lots of countries would have to agree cooperatively to have a massive nuclear war, to have enough stuff going off to really kill everybody. Um, and if we can cooperate that much to have a, a self-extinction event, then I would think maybe we could convince ourselves not to do it at all. So um, let's just hope that one doesn't happen. I, I doubt that it would. Um, and the last one would be an asteroid. Big enough to not just smush a few cities, but melt the whole surface of the planet so the people on the other side of the planet don't get killed. <coughs> so they do get killed and uh, all this stuff. It would have to be huge to really get all of us. Um, and uh, astrophysicists I've read about say uh, there are none large enough in the solar system to do that in the next 100,000 years anyway. So with fingers crossed, I make a case that I think there are going to be people um, around in these time scales and that's one reason why it's important at least to especially if we're setting those changes in motion. The, uh, the reason I didn't put climate change on the list, I'm absolutely sure there's no way climate change will kill everybody on the planet. First of all, we've adapted to climate changes for thousands of years, even with low technology. The other reason is some parts of the world, arguably, will become more habitable for people as these changes go on. So there will be refuges where some folks could actually do relatively well. And if I was going to vote for one place in the world, I'd say Greenland would be a good candidate. Um, we actually know what's under the ice there. If you do the radar surveys, we find out that the middle of Greenland is below sea level. If the ice is gone, you have a fjord there, a protected harbor, where the sea would come in. Um, you expose the rocks, which are actually full of minerals, uh, for gems and valuable metals. You'll expose land for agriculture, where you can then have a thriving source of fresh vegetables and livestock in a place that now has to import it at great expense from Denmark and Europe and places like that. Um, at that time, the Arctic Ocean will be ice-free. There will be shipping and commerce going through there. There will be fisheries. Greenland would be a great place to move, I would argue, uh, in the far future when it's that much warmer. So um, I don't see any way people are, are going to be wiped out in the next 100,000 years. So if you accept my argument, uh, people will live through this. Which means people have to live through this stuff, and that's ethically. If we set these changes in motion, why we should at least think about it and acknowledge the reach of our impacts on people and other ecosystems. So,
just to sort of uh, go through a little quick buffet of some of these changes we can actually see happening now to show that there's weight to these arguments. Um, we see this happening. Some things are losing, others are being winners in, this, in these kinds of changes. It's important to realize, though, that uh, when we get to the whiplash time and the cooling off time, the winners could well become losers in that far future as well. So, you know, you always hear about the polar bears, and the ring seals that need the ice in the Arctic. Um, so as the ice goes, the seals are going and the polar bears are going. But what you don't often hear is when they lose out, this actually represents an opportunity for other species. And as the ring seals are waning, harbor seals are moving in from the uh, North Atlantic and seeing it as a new frontier. And the brown bears and grizzly bears are actually moving north into polar bear territory, even to the point of hybridizing with the polar bears. So here's a polar grizzly or pizzly hybrid that was already uh, harvested or collected or basically shot in uh, Canada already, just showing that these changes are already in motion. Or you get um, the ice-adapted whales, the belugas and the narwhals. You notice they don't have a big fin on their back, which is nice to have if you're you know, bumping up against ice looking for breathing holes. They're in trouble as the ice retreats. Uh, but at the same time, other kinds of whales are moving in from the Atlantic and the Pacific, including orcas or pillar whales. They have that tall fin on their back, which you know, it's not a good thing to have if there's ice, but if it's open water, they're fine and they like to eat balloons in our woods. So it's, uh, it's great news for orcas and bad news for the native whales. It's not as simple as a, you know, just a all good or all bad. It's very interesting and very complicated. As we lose the sea ice, we're going to be, we're already losing the microbes and the fish and other animals that are adapted to the ice communities. And at the same time, as the ice is retreating, the sun is hitting the water, making it plankton grow more, and an entirely new food chain is starting to develop up there, even to the point that I'm told Russia is building a fishing fleet ready to take advantage of an open water fishery in the Arctic Ocean as that ice retreats. Or you can um, follow the geopolitical events. There's a huge land grab going up, going on up in the Arctic, which you may have heard about. Um, like, for example, um, the Northwest Passage and another one the northern sea route along the Russian coast is opening up, allowing trade between Europe and Asia, instead of having to go through Panama or the other canals. Um, and so unresolved territorial disputes are now bubbling to the surface as places that were considered unimportant when it was frozen are now becoming important because they're going to be worth money. So I'm not sure if you've heard of this. There's a, a little rock of an island between Greenland and Ellesmere Island in Canada. And uh, Denmark and Canada have almost come to blows over who owns that because uh, the territory was not clearly defined. And if you own the piece of rock, then you have the fishing and mineral rights for hundreds of miles around it. So uh, basically, uh, they, they almost came to blows several years ago over this. Um, the Danes would show up with a gunboat. They put up the Danish flag. They put a bottle of snobs at the bottom of the flag. They leave a sign saying, welcome to the Danish island. And then the, a Canadian gunboat would show up, knock over the flag, drink all the stops. I don't know if they left a sign or a Molson bottle, but um, that was going on until the boundary line was finally um, established. And, uh, so now they're not going to go to war over that, which is a good thing. I don't know if you've heard that Russia has claimed the North Pole. They put a submersible under the ice and planted a titanium flag on the seafloor right on the North Pole. And they've claimed it for Russia because of the mineral rights and the fishing rights and, and things like that. Uh, it's not officially recognized by the United Nations, but the point here is um, for those folks who may doubt that the Arctic is becoming ice free, should talk to these people who are about to go to war and are investing heavily economically in this brand new frontier that's probably gonna be very lucrative because the ice is retreating. So anyway, um, I'm, I've been trying to stick to facts here for you and avoid too much speculation. Um, one of the big facts is we are going to switch from fossil fuels sooner or later, um, either by doing it on purpose and getting the alternatives quickly or burning them all and then having to switch. So there's a fact. The switch is going to come. Um, the next fact is how we do it will affect the world for thousands of years. And that's the new information takeaway tonight. 
night. Another fact is it's not simply all good, all bad. It's complicated, um, and you need to see the whole picture to really take all these things into account. Some will gain, some will lose. But then, if you think in the long term, those winners and losers may actually change places later on. And uh, so then it raises ethical questions. How do you weigh the good and the bad? This is where the full long-term view is necessary to do the full evaluation here. So I'll just give you a few examples. Um, sad to say, um, although computer models often disagree about what rainfall is going to be in different parts of the world, they all agree that the southern part of Australia and the southern tip of Africa should become drier as the climate warms. So it's already pretty dry now. Um, my climate history uh, research in the southern tip of Africa also supports this. When we've had global warmings, it's gotten drier, coolings make it wetter. And the reason is these white clouds, the winter uh, storms, the rainstorms, uh, the westerly winds are pulling closer to Antarctica as it warms, um, just for various reasons. And the tropical belt actually gets wider. Everything sort of shifts towards Antarctica. And so they'll hit the land masses less often. And I, as far as we can tell, it, it's actually starting to happen. So uh, you could maybe uh, put uh, Southern Australia on the list of losers unless you can desalinate a lot of water. Um, of course, here in Brisbane, you've had the opposite problem recently, and uh, that could actually maybe be amplified as the tropical effect gets more powerful. So, um, you know, it's just my, my point um, earlier was um, just the warming itself is not necessarily the only problem. It's the changes in where the rain is falling or how powerful a drought is or how the temperatures are and things like that, that really affect folks. Um, so if you're kind of used to things being a certain way, when they change, if you're not resilient and not anticipating them in advance, it can be a major problem. So um, I'm just contrasting, you know, certain parts of the world are just using Australia as an example. When, if it gets wetter or drier, it can be an actual problem. And I, I know, I guess you're having troubles up, up in the north now as the insect borne disease, the dengue fever, is what a cross river virus, I think is, is that what it's called, uh, coming down. Ross. Ross. Yes. Um, so, and, and of course, you know, when it gets hotter, you may have more of a smog issue, and of course, the heat waves are stressful and bushfires. It's, it's just the, the idea that if you intensify or change what's considered normal, um, any, any direction of change can be a problem if you're not ready for it. So um, another aspect of this, you hear about a sea level rise. I just want to briefly go into this. There's your uh, Australia picture. But um, I do want to sort of dig into this just a little bit because we hear about it a lot. You may have seen this movie here, The Day After Tomorrow, where the big floods are engulfing cities and things like that. Um, it's certainly true that a sea level rise should happen, and it can actually be extreme in the extreme case. But what you don't often hear when you hear how high up it can come is how slow it happens. Um, and this is not to belittle the seriousness of the situation, but I think it is important to point it out. Um, you, you hear different estimates of how long it could take, but the, most estimates say it's centuries for these kinds of things to happen. Um, although there are folks that say um, if you come up incredibly fast, even they don't say it's like you have to run with the waves chasing you or anything, or you can't leave your kid on the beach to go get an ice cream for him because when you come back, they're swept away or any of that kind of thing. Uh, most of the reliable estimates I've heard from actual glaciologists and sea level experts, they say probably a meter or less per century is what we're looking at. So there are huge changes, but maybe not as deadly fast as what we've been hearing. Um, it's still worth taking it seriously. But it's also interesting to ask, what might it really be like to be in these cities as they're going under? And uh, we actually know, because we've got some. You have places like Venice, uh, some of the major cities in Asia, like Bangkok, and uh, um, a lot of the major cities in China are actually sinking it faster than sea level rises coming up just from groundwater extraction. So what's most likely to probably happen is it takes centuries for it to go all the way under. It's more of a chronic problem than an acute disaster. Uh, and maybe in a few cases, some people may actually make a tourist attraction out of it, like Venice. Um, but the last aspect of this, too, is, is kind of interesting as well. As the cities on the coast start going under, 
we sometimes joke about how we should invest in uh, land inland and it, because it's going to be oceanfront property someday. But that's actually probably going to happen sometimes. And you can see an example of that in Amsterdam, uh, which is now threatened by the sea level rise. But it's important to note, um, centuries ago, it was completely landlocked and was just sort of a nondescript village. Um, natural sea level rise eventually broke in over here and made this harbor, connected Amsterdam to the North Atlantic with shipping lanes, and gave it this huge economic boost and made it this great cultural center. So we can actually anticipate the real story will be, even as cities on the coastlines go under, the ones slightly inland may actually be looking with anticipation for a brief honeymoon of a century or two where they get to be the port for a while, and then they go under and the next one's in. It's going to be very interesting and complicated. So I'm uh, getting near the wrap up here for you. Um, there's some really interesting things that happen when you think on these time scales. Um, what seems unthinkable now, like a nice free Arctic, will become normal. And we have to realize that people in the far future may actually not like the recovery as well. When that kind of situation becomes an ancient, normal ecosystem and culture, people may actually be afraid of the refreezing. It's a very strange ethical thing. Another one is, on these time scales, we realize by looking at the natural cycles that uh, we're interfering with future ice ages. The next one from the natural cycles is due in about 50,000 years. If you remember the time scale, our carbon dioxide is going to be around in 50,000 years, and it's just warm enough then to cancel the next ice age. So you can actually say, that might be one of the few good things about the stuff we've done, especially if you're a fan of Canada. Uh, when you have an ice age, it's a mile thick sheet of ice, totally bulldozing the entire country of Canada and also in Northern Europe as well. So um, as far as I know, Canadians are not happy about global warming, but in the far future, their descendants might be to know that we have already prevented the next ice age, which is stunning that we would have that kind of power. So, to wrap up here, um, one of the useful things I think about the long-term view is it may help us actually look for win-win situations where you don't have to say, well, you know, we should uh, burn all our stuff so we prevent more ice ages for people down the line who will suffer on their behalf now. Maybe there's some good win-win situations. So if you want to save the planet, save the whales, um, maybe look for alternative energy sources. I'm actually, a, I'd encourage you to look up thorium power, which seems to have a lot of potential maybe as a relatively safe version of nuclear power would be a good energy source. Um, kind of tongue in cheek in a way. Um, I, I, I like to bring up one more good reason to do the right thing and switch quickly to whatever these alternative energy sources might be. And uh, I call it save the carbon for later because of this ice age thing. If, if it's good to have the global warming in the far future, but bad now, why don't we have a win-win situation? We leave the carbon in the ground now for all the different reasons that I was trying to present. And then it's nice and safely sequestered in the ground. So 100,000 years from now, when an ice age is starting up again, if people decide they don't want to have it, all they have to do, even if they have simple technology, go to the nearest mountain that has coal and light a fire, even if it's just flint and steel or something, and uh, set it on fire. Just like here in New South Wales, here's a mountain that's been burning for 6,000 years from a lightning strike. That's carbon dioxide going into the air, greenhouse gas. Uh, here's a coal fire at a mine in China. Just set a few mountains on fire, you put a little CO2 in and you stop the next ice age. Uh, and the great thing is, we don't have to decide for them. They can decide if they want to do this. So, kind of tongue in cheek, but a, one more good reason to make the switch. Save the current. So here's the end. The good news is I propose humans will survive. The bad news is many species may not. The reality is we will decide either by acting or doing nothing. You are a force of nature. As I said, we're so numerous, powerful, and so interconnected that we basically have the power to affect the future of the world for so long. Um, it's very important to be well informed, therefore, because what's in our minds will affect our future. So I urge you to um, look for the best information you can 
and ask the good questions, choose the good ideas and solutions, and support them when you hear them. So with that, I'd like to welcome you to our deep future and open for a few questions.